Hello, hello, dear listeners. Apologies for the relative silence last month. I was dealing with some tech issues, which I'll be doing an episode about in the near future. It it was certainly an adventure. Now, when I say tech issues, I do not mean tech issues that I could resolve myself, but more like tech overlord issues. But that is a story for another time. Today, I thought it would be fun to cover good old Dawkins. He's been making the headlines lately, eh? Given his stupid comments recently about how upset it makes him to see Ramadan lights or something. I mean, this is some Tommy Robinson bullshit. Incredibly embarrassing and lowbrow stuff coming from one of the original rational crew. Usually, they at least try to mask their racism and various bigotries in some sort of science and reason packaging. As thinly veiled as it is, they at least put some effort into not sounding like your everyday far-right hooligan from the EDL. But if you've been paying attention to Dawkins for a while, you very quickly realize that despite being a renowned public intellectual, his reactionary mind has, in fact, not advanced far beyond Tommy Robinson's in several aspects. (laughs) And uh, as posh as his accent may be, he is indeed infected by the same sort of brain worms. His recent proclamations of being a cultural Christian certainly shocked a bunch of people, but as I said before, if you paid any attention to him or other ultra-racist atheists, you start to see that their atheism is just a vessel for their real passion, and that is uh, bigotry and uh, Western chauvinism and even Christian supremacy. It's why Douglas Murray does episodes on embarrassing channels titled God-Shaped Hole. It's why Ayan Hirsi Ali has just entered the final phase of new atheism, which is, uh, you know, converting to Christianity to own the libs. <laughs> And it's also why Jordan Peterson received such a warm welcome in the New Atheist scene all the way back in 2017. Despite having a pretty anti-atheist history, it's what helped uh, legitimize a loon like Peterson. It's how the New Atheist scene became infused with Peterson's religious fundamentalism without any resistance at all. I even wrote a blog post back then about uh, Peterson specifically new atheist bedfellows. It's what causes these idiots to find allies among the Christian right for their other bigotries too, like transphobia. The overlaps between new atheism and the far right or the Christian right even are endless. Some may even refer to it as a type of... (laughs) merging. So this conversation that you're about to hear was actually recorded before the now infamous cultural Christian Dawkins clip went viral. But as you'll see, our conversation still touches on all of that. It's as if we had already heard it because it's been an ongoing theme both within the scene and with Dawkins in particular. And by the scene, I mean the new atheist scene, the post 9-11 obnoxious militant strain of atheism, which has now, I hope, fully been exposed as a far-right grift it has always been. You'd think it has by now, several times even, but uh, every time someone says it out loud, there's a group of defensive brocasters that pop up to defend the honor of new atheism. So let's see uh, if any come out for this conversation. But anyway... Here's the recent clip where Dawkins declares himself a cultural Christian, and there's really no need for anyone to be surprised because he's been referring to himself that way for years now. I know, I know, I know. The juxtaposition with that whole new atheist horseman thing and the cultural Christian thing is, on the surface, a very weird one, but not if you understand the purpose of this whole new atheist project. Well, I must say, I was slightly horrified to hear that Ramadan is being promoted instead. Horrified? I mean, come the fuck on. No one is taking Christmas or Easter away entirely and replacing it with scary Ramadan. Relax, dude. This is just your average Fox News, war on Christmas type of fear-mongering. It's so silly. Who are the snowflakes supposed to be again? 
<laughs> it's fine to include and celebrate other non-Christian holidays too, Grandpa. You'll be fine. Christianity will be fine. I do think that we we are culturally a Christian country. I'm, I call myself a cultural Christian. I'm, I'm not a believer. But there's a distinction between being a believing Christian and being a cultural Christian. And so, you know, I, I love hymns and Christmas carols and um, I... I sort of feel at home in the Christian ethos. I feel that we are a Christian country in that sense. Uh, it's true that statistically the number of people who actually believe in Christianity is going down, uh, and I, I'm happy with that. But I would not be happy if, um, for example, we lost all our cathedrals and our beautiful parish churches. Um, so I, I count myself a cultural Christian. I think it would matter if we... Certainly, if we substituted any alternative religion, that would be tr truly dreadful. Well, which brings um, me to, to my supplementary point, which is that, as we know, church attendance is plummeting, but the building, the erection of mosques across Europe, I think 6,000 are under construction, and there are many more, I mean, are being planned. So do you think, do you regard that as a problem? Do you think that matters? Yes, I do, really. I mean, I, 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 I don't... I, I have to choose my words carefully. I mean, I, if I had to choose between Christianity and Islam, I'd choose Christianity every single time. I mean, it seems to me to be a, a fundamentally decent religion um, in a way that I think Islam is not. I think you're going to have to explain why you say that, Professor Dawkins. Why is Islam profundly, well, the, the pro way, the fundamentally way, the, not decent like Christianity? Yes, I mean, the, 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 the way women are treated, I mean, Christianity is not great about that. It's had its problems with female vicars and female bishops and things. But there's an active hostility to women, which is promoted, I think, by the holy books of Islam. I'm not talking about individual Muslims, who, of course, are quite, quite different. But the, but the doctrines of Islam, the Hadith and the, and the Quran, is fundamentally um, hostile to women, hostile to gays, um, and uh, I find that I like to live in a culturally Christian country, although I do not believe a single word of the Christian faith. You hear that? How do you dub one entire diverse religion practiced in a plurality of ways in different parts of the world by millions of people? How do you dub the whole thing fundamentally indecent and another fundamentally decent, especially when they're so connected to one another and believe so many of the same things. It's so juvenile, like my dad is better than your dad kind of thing. And <laughs> this is when he says he's choosing his words carefully. <laughs> For fuck's sake. Oh, it's really no different to what you'd hear at various far-right or even white nationalist rallies. And this stripping everything of context and boiling it down to Islam, bad. Christianity, good. It, it's really what these losers do best, eh? Anti-intellectualism. Has Christianity always only just had slight issues with female vicars or, or have there been other problems in different parts of the world or throughout the ages, maybe? Like accusing women of being witches and burning them. Or how about the part where the Bible says husbands should rule over their wives? How about the fact that the Christian right is still managing to roll back women's reproductive rights in the U.S. today? It's really incredible how he ignores all that. Oh, and his mentioning that he doesn't like Islam because its scriptures are hostile to gays is really something, too. Firstly, because these guys always seem to portray Muslims as these pre-programmed religious robots that literally know all the scripture by heart as if they would even know of every hadith out there. It's not even the main thing people read. I am not a fan of either the Quran or the Hadith or of religion in general, but I think it's important to talk about it in an honest and good faith way, no pun intended, especially when talking about a minority religion that is commonly used to fearmonger and spread violent hatred. So yeah, many Muslims just stick to reading the Quran. Hadith is considered a secondary source and the verses are often debated. So many aren't even seeing the Hadith. 
I honestly didn't until after I became an atheist. And that is despite growing up in Saudi Arabia and having a daily Quran teacher that came to the house. The Hadith rarely even came up. He focused more on pronunciations and memorization and simply learning how to read the Arabic script. Most Muslims read the Quran in Arabic whether they understand it or not. So if they're not Arab, like me, I'm South Asian, they're reading words by just phonetically pronouncing them. Many a time, people just don't know what they're reading, unless it's someone who specifically seeks Saudi translation. And if we're talking about problematic, bigoted scripture, I mean, I oppose all of that. But it's not unique to Islam. You can find plenty of it with very similar themes throughout the Abrahamic faiths. It's also ironic that he dislikes Islam because of the scripture being hostile to gays. When Dawkins himself, who is not an old book written centuries ago, Dawkins of today spends his time being hostile to a particularly vulnerable part of the queer community. He spends his time legitimizing vicious anti-trans bigotry like that is what he mostly uses his platform for in 2024. So I don't know where he gets off complaining about an old, obsolete book from 1400 years ago not being gay friendly enough. Like, just the irony. And here's another clip from a letter Dawkins wrote to Ayan Hirsi Ali after her embarrassing conversion to Christianity, where he seems to concede a heck of a lot before he actually goes into criticizing how silly her conversion for anti-wokeness reasons is. I might agree with you, I actually do, that Putinism, Islamism, and postmodernist wokery pokery are three great enemies of decent civilization. I might agree with you that Christianity, if only as a lesser of evils, is a powerful weapon against them. I might add that Christianity has been the inspiration for some of the greatest art, architecture, and music the world has ever known. You'll hear us talk about this clip later in the conversation, but I just... How do you even compare Islamism, Putinism, and so-called wokery-pokery? And what kind of moron do you have to be to think Christianity is a great way to fight these stupidly grouped supposed threats to civilization? Like with Islamism, I assume he's talking about jihadism. Okay, that, that's bad. I can definitely agree. But how the fuck does wokeness compare to that? There was a brief period when these new atheist horsemen used to push back against the Bill O'Reilly Fox News types Now they've just turned into that themselves. As someone who actually values secular advocacy, these are bleak times for me. These are the idiots that represent us in the public eye. Anyway, here's a little more from that same letter to Ayan Hirsi Ali, and it is quite something. I once got into trouble for extolling the beauty of Winchester Cathedral bells by comparison with the aggressive-sounding yell of Allahu Akbar, the last thing you hear before the bomb goes off or before your head rolls away from your body. I might agree, I think I do, although certainly not in its earlier history, that Christianity is morally superior to Islam. You'll also hear us discuss that whole church bells versus Allahu Akbar tweet in this conversation too, but this clip goes way further than the assholery that tweet contained, where in some sort of defiance to the pushback he got for his ignorant views about how wonderful church bells sound versus how terrible Allahu Akbar sounds, he seems to think, hey, I got some grief for this before, so why not step it up? And this time, he's generalizing the phrase Allahu Akbar commonly said in every prayer by every grandma and child. It just means God is great. Not my favorite phrase on account of my disbelief, but what he's saying here is ludicrous. He seems to define it as an explicitly terrorist phrase. Now, sure, terrorists may use it, but it's a regular Arabic Islamic phrase. And to demonize and caricature not only Islam, but Muslims in this way is is abhorrent. He posted this 
two months ago, so four months into Israel's genocide on Palestinians, where they are largely dehumanized using these exact types of religion-based tropes. Muslims are terrorists. Muslims follow a fundamentally indecent religion. Muslims are hostile to women and gays. They're savage, barbarians, just like Netanyahu said. The children of darkness versus the children of light. I mean, they are being rounded up and mass slaughtered with precisely this type of dehumanization laying the groundwork for it. In the middle of this genocidal assault, great humanist mind and intellectual thinky type Richard Dawkins chose to put out these types of words repeatedly. It's despicable in any time, really, but it's especially vile and dangerous in these times. Oh, like, I can't say it enough. This is a dark, dark period in global politics. Also deeply shameful for the so-called humanist, skeptic, rational, atheist scene. It is appalling how they have spent years talking about how much more enlightened and compassionate they are after leaving the shackles of regressive religion behind. But none of the humanist organizations I follow have said a critical word that I've seen about the biggest humanitarian crisis in modern history that is currently unfolding before our eyes. It's really something how the leading skeptics won't apply an ounce of skepticism to the constant stream of blatant lies coming from the IDF and how the rational atheist figureheads are avoiding all the facts surrounding this assault on Gaza and not even saying a word about the religious supremacy being used as a tool by Israel in this mass slaughter. I think that tells you everything you need to know, really, about how much they live by their declared values. You don't have to love Islam or religion of any sort to be a decent human being. You can and should advocate for equality, dignity, respect, safety for atheists and theists alike. We should apply our values consistently and and recognize that fear-mongering about vulnerable theist groups is not much different to religious fundamentalists fear-mongering about atheists. Anyway, before we get to the conversation about Dawkins, please do consider supporting the show. It's funded entirely by listeners like you, and since I don't do ads, it really only just barely, barely survives. So if you enjoy and value this work, if you think it's important to support the ever-shrinking, left-leaning atheist voices, please do consider becoming a subscriber via patreon.com forward slash nice mangoes. And another thing that's very important is leaving podcast reviews. If you leave a five-star review for this podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, Dawkins fanboys go into a ridiculous rage. It's super worth it. Trust me. (laughs) And if you enjoy criticism of the new atheists in general, do check out my miniseries on Sam Harris, who is also going through a particularly deranged phase currently. I will link it in the show notes. And hey, Dawkins, if you're listening, happy Ramadan and also Eid Mubarak. (laughs) And uh, yeah, here we go. Here's the rest of the episode. Welcome to the Polite Conversations podcast, where every episode is focused on civility, decorum, and good manners. And I'm your lovable, non-controversial host, Ina. If you know me, you know I definitely don't like to ruffle any feathers at all. All right, well, welcome, everyone. I have a very special guest here with me today, Jason Lemieux. I've been a listener of yours for a while. I previously worked 
at a, a nonprofit in the United States known as the Center for Inquiry. And Richard Dawkins was and is still on the board of directors there and largely functions as its figurehead. Also for Richard, the Richard Dawkins Foundation, or am I getting that? The Richard Dawkins Foundation is now, a, it's like a subordinate entity of the Center for Inquiry. Okay. Um, I've been in the movement, what's called the secular movement in the United States for a few years now as an activist. And I've worked at a couple different roles since then. Mm -hmm. And yeah, now I'm just a guy who maintains an interest in these things. And, you know, sometimes I, I share my opinion on social media still less and less on Twitter. Right. (laughs) Everyone seems to be going that way. Less and less on Twitter. And you are a fellow atheist and uh, someone who is interested in the direction that whole scene is constantly headed in, <laughs> like a yes. worse and worse direction. Gosh. But um, yeah, we had planned to speak like what, a couple of years ago. Definitely more than a year. Yeah. Yeah. And then I guess it just never happened. Stuff with my life was kind of crazy the past year and a half ago. And I'm glad we're finally speaking now. Uh, do you want to say what what you said when when you reached out to me this time? Because well, so my last day at the Center for Inquiry was March 24th or 23rd or 24th. 2021, uh, which means that the three-year non-disclosure agreement that I signed uh, expired two days ago on March 24th, 2024. Interesting. Yeah, which means so you know, and as I and as I said to you, then um, I mean, obviously the biggest interest that you you would have in my experience is uh, the association with Richard Dawkins mm-hmm. and my interactions with him. I will say that he's just such a dick in full view of the public that. That there's no secret, secret. There's not a lot of need to dig too deeply. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Um, But yeah, I mean, um, there are definitely things that I think have gone unknown until now that'll probably confirm what people already think about the guy. Yeah. And I just would love to just, you know, share my assessment of where things are and, and where we might go. Yeah, no, I'd, lo- I'd love to hear it. I'd love to hear more. I mean, it's uh, you and I share the same concerns, I think, about the increasing garbageification of the scene. And, uh, you know, in order to salvage whatever we have left, I think it's very important to criticize and point out the issues. And uh, without that, the public faces of the atheist scene are just like more and more embarrassing by the second, I think. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's really a shame that, I mean, you know, a guy like Richard Dawkins continues to keep himself in the spotlight decade after decade and sucks up a lot of donor dollars for, you know, yeah. concerned wealthy donors who, who want to have a secular movement. But there are a ton of other younger voices that are active and really smart and thoughtful about how they do things. They're just not necessarily part of an organization that has a lot of money behind it. So, I, I mean, I think there, I think there is a movement. I think it's going to rely less and less on those few legacy, quote-unquote, secular nonprofit organizations that we have in the United States. Oh, I really hope um, so, because yeah. none of them have been something to be proud of, in my view. <laughs> yeah, so I will say the kind of things that will show up on your radar – uh, via the headlines are going to be generally not good things about these organizations. But I will say that um, there are some spots of light, like American atheists uh, has, you know, they had, they had a huge controversy years ago with their former Silverman, then leader, David Silverman. Yeah. He is now persona non grata. I don't know if they would use that term, but um, yeah, they, he definitely does not inspire the movement of that or the, or the direction of that organization at this point. I mean, he went from identifying as a feminist to being a fully, like, open, racist, misogynist, uh, men's rights type after his allegations came out. Absolutely. And, you know, and uh, I don't know if you know this, but he tried to, he attempted to sue, he filed a lawsuit against the the American atheists and its Mm -hmm. now president and other people, and it got laughed out of court. 
Uh, he wrote it himself. He didn't do a good job. Well, that's great. Um, yeah. And then there was also the allegations against another board member, another atheist podcast associate, that whole brosphere. Um, what's his name? Andrew Torres. Mm-hmm. I know less about that one. But yeah, I would say that, you know, I, you know I'll let that organization speak for itself. But yeah, I would say that if there's an active future in the among organizations, like institutionally right now, it would be with American Atheists and to a lesser extent, the American Humanist Association, which, as you know, shared some leadership years ago by revoking Dawkins's Humanist of the Year award. Oh, yes, that's yeah. correct. That was one good thing I do remember. And then they got, they got so much outrage amongst all the, I guess, majority of the scene that is very vocal online is right-wing atheists who will, you know, object to being called right-wing, but let's face it, they are right-wing atheists, they're anti-woke, yeah. anti-feminist. Yeah. The majority of the atheists who show up on Twitter. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. And on, on YouTube, and <laughs> yeah. So they were really pissed. They were really, really pissed when uh, yeah. Dawkins, uh, what was it, award was revoked? It was, so he had been awarded, uh, I believe in 1996, he was given their Humanist of the Year award. They issue one every year. Yeah. And in the light of his anti-transgender comments that he makes, where he's just jacking off, just asking questions. Yeah. To my understanding, there's this is now, like, terribly bad blood between the Center for Inquiry and the American Human Association. See if I would never, will we'll under the current leadership, never work with them again. Oh, really? Um, yeah. But, you know, it, AHA was very careful when they, they put out a statement saying that, you know, we're responding to this latest tweet of his, but this is only the latest in a, in a, in a pattern of behavior that he's already shown. That's right. And when was that that they revoked it? Was it like 21? Oh, t- I mean, I can Google it right now. Yeah, like no. 2022? Okay, so fairly, fairly recent. Either 21 yeah. or 22. Yeah. Yeah, before that, like, he had said so much. Like, I mean, he's quite a colorful character, right? Like, so he's had some tweets in the past about mild rape, which were... Yeah, mild pedophilia. He was minimizing the the harm. And, I mean, this is all totally unsolicited. There's no reason... For him to open his mouth at all, but this is what he decided. To talk <laughs> That's to. right. So I'll there was there was mild pedophilia and also mild rape, which I think he classified as you know date rape or something like that. This was again a few years ago, so forgive me if my details are fuzzy. But uh, then there was the ongoing very eugenicsy kind of things, opinions about women choosing to continue pregnancies where the baby has Down syndrome. and that, like, was a, that was an interview that was a live, I think, well, there's video of it. It was a yeah. live podcast interview with, I, I, I believe he was an Irish host, but this was like a, a prominent podcast host who revealed midway into the conversation that he had a child with Down syndrome. Right. And all Dawkins could do was try to soften what he had just said. Yeah. You got involved in a Twitter interaction with a woman who said she would be faced with a real ethical dilemma if she became pregnant with a baby with Down syndrome. You tweeted, abort it and try again. It would be immoral to bring it into the world if you have the choice. Now, I, I saw you were speaking to somebody who, who did bring someone like that into the world, okay, but we let's put that aside. Why is it no. immoral not to abort it? Well, uh, that was probably putting it a bit too strongly, but... Um Given that uh, the um, the amount of suffering in the world uh, probably does not go down, probably does go up, uh, c- compared to having another child who doesn't have Down syndrome. What I'm interested in saying, is how do you know that it increases the amount of suffering in the world to bring in a child with Down syndrome into the world? I don't know it for certain. It seems okay. to me to be plausible. You probably would increase the amount of happiness in the world more by having an, another child instead. Do you think, but you have no reason for knowing that? I have no direct evidence. No, you don't, oh, okay. Just, just you know, you're such a scientific, logical person that I thought that you could possibly have some logical uh, backup to it. Do you know anyone with Down syndrome? Not, uh, not, not intimately, no. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, everyone has their own experience of it and possibly 
my experience would be that you're not necessarily right, and I think a lot of people would think you're not necessarily right. Look, I'm anyway. sure. I'm, I'm. I'm sure that 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 you love your child. Oh yeah, nothing, nothing, nothing to do with that. I'm, I, I'm not having an emotional discussion with you here. I'm yeah. simply having a logical discussion with you. Do you think it would be immoral for them not to do it? Let's leave out of the. Let's leave out the immoral. No, but you brought be... immoral into it. Okay, well, I, I take that back. Okay. I think it would be wise. I think it would be wise and sensible. You know, children who are so-called perfect can cause terrible suffering in the world as well. But I suppose we have no way of checking, have we? Uh, no, of course. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, mean, I was like, I thought the restraint of the host in that situation was amazing. But, yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah, it's just of a piece with, you know, the way he's been for years. And, and you know, now he's, like, really doubled and tripled down on the transphobia. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's appalling, really. And it plays into the stereotypes of, like, the evil, godless, uh, you know, science-loving. Like, I hate that, that it gives religious conservatives that, thing to hold against secular people like look at that when you leave religion you lose all morality (laughs) it's obviously not true it's obviously not true there is nothing inherent within being an atheist that would make you be that way but somehow the most prominent figures are these really creepy creepy assholes Yeah, well, I don't know that religious conservatives have so much daylight between their views on transgender people and Richard Dawkins necessarily, but no, but on the eugenics thing. (laughs) Yeah, and you know they're they're opportunists, so they'll throw whatever they can in your face. Even like you know, like when uh, Justin Trudeau, our prime minister, it was found out that he had these like photos in blackface, and then suddenly you see. All these conservatives that used to defend blackface every other day are like, oh, look at what a racist. And now all of a sudden have a problem with it. Yeah. So, and then he had this other tweet about eugenics in 2020 where he said, it's one thing to deplore eugenics on ideological, political, moral grounds. It's quite another to conclude that it wouldn't work in practice. Of course it would. It works for cows, horses, pigs, dogs, and roses. Why on earth wouldn't it work for humans? Facts ignore ideology. And I just remember thinking, what the actual fuck kind of humanist could be pro-eugenics like this? Like, so, I mean, he's not pro, to be fair, not openly pro. He'll always deny it, but he'll say things that let it slip, that he's like, well, of course, it's a fa- it works. Right, he makes his he he makes his sympathies clear. He could choose to speak about any number of topics. Right, and this is the one that he chooses to speak about. Right, so over and over after he got a bunch of backlash, I think it was like four, five, six hours later. Then he tweeted, "For those determined to miss the point, I deplore the idea of a eugenic policy. I simply said, deploring it doesn't mean it wouldn't work." Just as we breed cows to yield more milk, we could breed humans to run faster or jump higher. But heaven forbid that we should do it. And then eugenics was like trending for that couple of days. And so it's just so disturbing that a renowned biologist would legitimize it in this sort of way. Well, I think part of it, I mean, I think that really goes to show part of the problem with Dawkins and with people like him. That, uh, you know, he is a biologist, hasn't published in a long time, but is a world-known, accomplished biologist. But, you know, I I forget who, maybe we can look it up after, but somebody wrote a pretty good sort of analysis of his comments there that I remember seeing, um, which spoke to the, you know, the, the problem of these scientists from STEM fields who become these, these stars of the quote unquote atheist movement or secular movement or skeptical movement who know little or nothing about social sciences and about right. just what is known about people and, and systems of people and how they operate. You know, with the eugenics thing, it, it was pointed out that breeding, like, you know, genetically altering creatures or, or, or quote unquote breeding to change the traits of an animal or something is yes that's a that's a technique that can be done that's physically possible to do but eugenics is a political project yeah eugenics includes a 
here's why we want to do this, because th- these are our values about what is a good kind of person to have and a, and a bad person to have. And that's where saying that it would or wouldn't work it becomes either nonsense or, or it's just a meaningless statement or it just it just it completely ignores the fact that right it explicitly included eugenics included like moral judgments on people right for being promiscuous or non-religious or whatever right or for yeah or for having any one of a number of disabilities or different abilities um yeah and and so right but even outside of physical characteristics it was highly judgmental right but to say that it would or wouldn't work it's this utopian political aspiration to a perfect society so it won't work for that reason because perfection is impossible right that you'll never achieve a real utopia but he's also missing the point he's also missing what's morally and socially important here right when he says that it wouldn't work would or wouldn't work like it just there's this larger trend I've noticed that it's part of where these guys like Dawkins. They, first of all, they're one thing that I can really I think you know offer some insight into is that Dawkins in particular is surrounded by a small network of handlers that shield him from accountability and really from just the outside world. And so he is just surrounded by these people who reinforce this idea in him that he has this like all-purpose brilliance that he can just look at. A phenomenon and describe to us what it is better than most people would be able to. When once he leaves the domain of biology and related sciences, that becomes less and less true. Even in the domain of biology and sciences in the current oh, yeah. world, yeah. he seems very outdated. Every year that goes by that he isn't cracking open the latest peer-reviewed journals and keeping up with the literature is a year that he falls further and further behind. <laughs> but I am not qualified to... Right. parse out all of the ways in which he's wrong about biology but yeah i mean like it's like they don't they're so they are ignorant of the social sciences for the most part like they don't they don't know what's possible to know about society or politics or culture or economics or the way that people what we know about how people and groups of people behave so they think that they can intuit it and that because they're so brilliant that's really the best information that any of the rest of us could hope for. So, I mean, Dawkins had said a while ago about how every I don't know, if every pro-transgender activist or, or some some sort of left wing, like everything that the left does that is in over uh, that is in excess that is like another vote for Donald Trump, basically, is what he said. And this is just sheer unadulterated opinion <laughs> that he is. Also, I believe largely he just like copies what Sam Harris said a year ago. I think That's what I was going to say. Yeah, like, this like is... what, if you, yeah, no, you, you'll hear him say it like a year, at least six months, a year or two, maybe even two years later, in like a, in the same phrasing or extremely similar verbiage to something controversial that Sam had said, and then the whole world had kind of forgotten about and moved on from. Right, Dawkins was he was saying, you know. Leftist excesses are, are increasing votes for Trump, right? But that was just something he was saying that he assumed was true that he has never looked into. And the thing is, you know, I, I studied political science at university. Mm-hmm. And so I know that the behavior of American voters in presidential elections is maybe the most obsessively researched thing in all of political science, certainly in the United States. Right. And so there's no reason for you or anybody who who is aware of that, there's no reason for us to turn to the public and say anything at all about what American voters do. If we haven't consulted the literature or if we're not an expert, there's just why would you think you know better? You don't. Yeah, it's just taking any opportunity they can, really, to rail against the left while denying that they're uh, right wing. It's it's such an annoying position for me personally. Um, I almost have to respect people like Tucker Carlson more than that, just for being honest. Mm. Well, I don't know that I really <laughs> believe Tucker Carlson is honest. I mean, no, no, no. Overall. Yes, he's not um, fully honest. He also hides his power level. He doesn't say, "Oh, I'm a white nationalist" or whatever. That would be fully honest. But at least he's honest about leaning to the right. The bare, the very bare minimum. Yeah. So if I might shift gears just a little bit, this is reminding me of another sort of 
semi-related issue with Dawkins, and that's what I see as again something that I think he he lifted from Sam Harris a year a year after the fact, but a sort of subtle kind of Christian supremacy. Yes. Uh, where yes, the idea is that basically treating like religion as a zero sum game, where if you have more of one religion, you'll have less of another. And they've decided that Islam is the worst religion. And so therefore, to the extent we can have Christianity in quote unquote, the West, that is like preventing Islam from becoming larger and more extreme, basically is the idea. Right. And that's just so um, bizarre, right? As Sam Harris lives in America, Muslims do not have any kind of institutional power in America. It's Christians that are no. screwing no, things yeah. up for the whole country, not Muslims. And in the UK, as much fear-mongering as there is about, oh, you know, there's no go zones, and uh, uh, what's his name, Sadiq Khan is like what, infiltrated <laughs> and that kind of bullshit. Like, let's let's yeah. face it, it's not Muslims that are running the UK either. So... It's absurd Decidedly to me, this, not, no. this point of view, right? And Dawkins has openly said, like, Christianity is a bulwark against something much, much worse. Now, we can take a wild guess at what that something is. And, right, I right. mean, he also used to, he did that that really funny tweet about church bells, like... That was what I was hoping we would get to. Yeah. Yes, he did the church bells tweet. Describe the tweet for the, for the listeners. Okay, so... It's a tweet on July 16th, 2018, uh, in which, you know, it's a picture of that somebody has taken of Dawkins that he's posted in front of a big cathedral, I assume, in the United Kingdom. Yeah, it says, listening to the lovely bells of Winchester, one of our great medieval cathedrals. So much nicer than the aggressive sounding, quote unquote, Allahu Akbar, <laughs> end quote. And then he says, or is that just my cultural upbringing? So I think this is a really, I think this... <laughs> I mean, it's a dickish tweet. I think it actually sh- it, it, it shows more of his colors than it might be a, than it might be apparent at first glance. Uh-huh. Because I think that that's that la- that question that he ends with, or is that just my cultural upbringing? That's the sort of thing where, like, if you've taken you know a few social science classes, you're like, of course it is. What would you think it was? It's just so yes, stupid. You, you've it's... been conditioned for decades and decades to think the one thing sounds nicer than the other. Of course it's your cultural upbringing. You know, then we could get into the, you know, across the quote-unquote Islamic world, the, what is it, the, the muezzin is the... Is the guy the, who says it. The, so the azan, okay, okay. you're talking about the call to prayer? The azan, yeah. Or, or the salah. Yeah, I mean, that can be, that is delivered in a whole, there's a whole range of styles and tones so I, I actually served in the U.S. Marine Corps. I, I served three tours in Iraq from oh, 2003 okay. to 2006. Um, and even in Iraq, like, uh, I, over the course of those three tours, I was in uh, the southern part that is Shia majority that had been, you know, severely oppressed under Saddam Hussein. Right. Um, all the way into the middle of the Sunni Triangle, where we were kind of occupying, if anybody could be a beneficiary of this tyrant, it would be, you know, Sunnis in the Sunni Triangle who, who benefited from you know, kind of being on the same team with him in that sense. Um, and you, there was a huge, there was a huge range. There was a huge range in how pious people sort of acted. And they, there was a, there was a range in the way that they would, yeah, again, a, a sing uh, or, or deliver the azan. Yeah. Um, from very like sort of spoken word, which would sound like harsher to my ear to a much more sort of sing song. Yeah. Anyway, it's just, it's just, again, the whole tweet was gratuitous. He didn't need to say a word. He could have chosen not to say anything that day. But here, Ina, here is where it is great that I am talking to you today. Because I am here to share with you that at the time that this tweet was tweeted, Richard Dawkins did not have the password to his Twitter account. What? It had been decided... I guess I don't know what the... I wasn't there for the decision. But some combination of Dawkins is like quote-unquote, better angels, and his handlers had decided that he simply could not be trusted oh. to read things that are going to make him look good um, <laughs> or are going to, like, have a positive impact on him and his, you know, interests. So the keys had been removed. He had been—this was, this was approved. This was approved by other people in his orbit 
who did not anticipate that there would be any backlash to this. They they can't they they never could have predicted. They didn't predict that anybody would see anything wrong with it. Wait, are you saying they didn't predict that that tweet in particular people yeah. would find offensive? Correct. Yeah, they thought that their screening had like removed any potential like risk of yeah. I mean, yeah. So, they thought that they were the people, like they thought that they were people of better judgment in these matters who were like, yeah, yeah, this one's okay. So wait, yeah, so he did he tweet that? He didn't. He did not press the tweet button because he doesn't. He did not have the password. So who his wrote, who wrote that? that? He may have wrote it. He may have dictated to somebody else. Okay. Right. And then and they, they approved I it. Mean, he, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the password was already not with him when before this tweet. It wasn't this tweet that caused that password to be removed. No, before. Correct. Correct. So yeah, do you this, know? This was a tweet. Do you know at what point, what triggered that kind of decision? Which tweet was it that... Oh, boy. I do not. I do not. Um, no. And, you know, God, there could have been so many of them. That's true. But I'm it's... sure, you know, again, it was something of a pattern. That, and, and the funny thing is, is that this was then marketed to the employees of Center for Inquiry later as this, like, really, really just, like, wise, benevolent move on the part of Richard Dawkins that he knows that he is a man who is not best suited to Twitter. And so, and then, I mean, kind of the rest of it went unspoken, but so people like me review his tweets and make sure that they're all okay to send. Oh, so was that, was that ever your job? No, because that's the sort of thing that is not at the time. So later on, he he finally like threw such a big stink that they gave him his password back. His, right, I was going to say like his Twitter, his Twitter is exceptionally unhinged these days, so he must have it back. Yeah. Um, so my job was in, was in policy, but there is no the only person who has real close interaction with him, at least when I was there, was the CEO of the organization, right? And she was this like filter through which. None of us would ever even be allowed close to this man, except under like close supervision. And so there was so the CEO, but then a few other people who some of who were employees of the organization, but they were sort of advising and reviewing Dawkins' tweet in a capacity that is not their official capacity in the organization, not even close. So it's basically to say that there is this organization with people who have titles and are, you know, are paid a salary and have are given a set of responsibilities for things. But then there's this other group of this. It's almost like a shadow structure uh, that determines what will happen regarding Richard Dawkins and what and he will do. They're not paid. They're not paid to be doing that, except for the CEO, arguably. But the point is that the people whose job is it, whose responsibility it is, so like you know, in policy, like. I could have been asked for any number of tweets. What are the potential political consequences of this? Right. If people see this, who might be like, because I was trying to advocate for the rights of non-believers and for science-based policy on, at, in the U.S. federal government and in the states. And I was, and you know, the thing about going to Congress is you have to learn to become very, very gregarious and agreeable to a huge range of people. Right. And be ready to find, like, you know, be ready to make allies where you can and just generally not do stupid things that alienate people for no good reason or to no, or to no apparent benefit, right? Which he does all the time. So you have to go to, <laughs> like, you know, there's the kinds that you can, you'll, you'll find like the 10% of people in Congress who are just already inclined to agree with you. And then there's this much bigger group of people who, like, could be convinced but you got the job of convincing them. And and that it, it's just impossible when you've got this idiot out there. Right. Just utterly, just like, pointlessly inflammatory and controversial things. And you'd have to go talk to highly educated staffers of members of Congress on Capitol Hill and just pray and hope that they are not reading Twitter in their off time. They don't know the last thing he said. Right. But if you just Google his name... To- the worst yeah. things come up. And as you know, we, you know, you, you brought the, I mean, the general stigma against atheists that's reinforced by guys like this. There's a lot of people on Capitol Hill who, who are religious. Like I would have, I was really surprised before I got into policy. There are a lot of Christians. Yeah. I'm not surprised to hear that at all, unfortunately. And, but. and 
Well, I so I will say I, I, I want to be very clear that I'm not I'm not saying that that is a negative thing. I'm just I'm merely describing that, hmm. and, and because even among Christians, I mean that's the the word the term Christian in the United States can mean so many things. Like it's it's a hugely diverse. So these, I mean, these are people with, there are many, many different beliefs among the people who would identify as, who identify as Christians in Capitol Hill. But my point was just that there are a lot of people who are Christian or are religious, or at least are, are sympathetic to religion, who could be convinced. Like, if we can make a solid case, and we can do it respectfully, and we can, and we can show how we want what's best for everybody, not just for, we're not calling for special privileges for ourselves— we want the same rights that are available to everybody, and we understand that in fighting for our rights, we ha- we are enmeshed in a larger struggle for the rights of all. Right, but I would think that these tweets tinged with a little bit of Christian supremacy would only endear Dawkins to the religious people in power in the U.S. So there are a lot of Christians. Even I, I mean, I'm including the Democratic Party. I'm including in like left wing. Right, 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 right. And you know that includes like I mean, you know, in in African American communities, there will be a lot of you know there will be liberation churches. Like so, right. it's not. But the point is like these are people who. I can absolutely make the case to them why they should care about atheist rights and why and why they should protect the rights of atheists and why freedom of religion necessarily includes freedom from religion. Right. These are people who I can win them over or I can at least like defuse a lot of the like probably like instinctive aversion they might have to this argument. I can do that speaking to them with respect and openness and transparency. Right. They are they are reasonable people who they've never even heard this argument before. This is I, I've had this conversation with people where they've never heard somebody say this out loud before. And so they've never had to think about it. But now that I bring it up, they they want to look more into it. Yeah. But it's um, yeah, he makes it harder for you. Yeah. Com- I mean, he's doing the complete opposite. He's saying he's 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 yeah. And then they claim to be a humanist organization. And that's I know it's that's so what's really, really unfortunate. And he's surrounded by people who don't understand that he has done anything wrong. Well, that's the people that he wants to be surrounded by, I guess, right? Like, just people that agree. Oh, yes. Well, and they and they want more than anything to be surrounded by him. Like, yeah. it's, it's this really, really weird, psychophantic... I mean, you know, the term cult gets thrown around a lot, but... Um, actually, there's something else. There's, a, there's an interesting pivot here maybe that i think you know who coven synopathy is uh yes, the name yes, may, yes. Be familiar to you, but she's yeah yeah so she she is a journalist and author yeah who has you know done a lot of work in the quote-unquote skeptic movement one of the rare few and she is a woman of color she is a of well she is a i think she would prefer to say that she is not white. She is of South Asian descent. I believe she's of Indian descent. Um, but she was on contract to do some writing for the Center for Inquiry for a while. Yeah. And the organization basically terminated her her contract because she was criticizing Richard Dawkins and she was criticizing strains of racism and misogyny and Islamophobia and transphobia in these quote unquote skeptic movements and secular movements. Yeah. And she criticized Dawkins directly. And so they treated that as not just unflattering to Dawkins or not just damaging to his reputation, but in damaging Dawkins' reputation as like therefore an attack on humanism and skepticism itself. Oh yeah. Because he's so important and so central that you can't undermine him, no matter what. No matter what he does, no matter what he says, no matter how he behaves, we are now all chained to this guy. Yep. And we need him so desperately. When they terminated Coven, they removed all of her articles. Every single thing written on her name was removed wow. from CNN. Wow. It was completely erased from it. There was a huge backlash to that, including from people of clout and money, which is really the only thing that the leadership cared about, in my experience. And so they they then reinstated, they then, like, reposted her articles. It was because it was a... It was a Against journalistic best practices, right. like, as I understand it, is is unheard of. But when they did that, they wrote a statement to explain themselves, and this was only to their sort of like 
high powered donor friends and to people that they thought, you know, they're only speaking to the important people. They never speak to the little people, but they wrote this, they wrote this statement and they put it on the website. And it, it, so it's got a unique URL. It's a web page, right? And it explains, and if you go and read else, and I'll show you the link, but they basically just say, it's basically as simple as, all right, we had to remove ourselves from Coven because she said that CFI is racist and she said that Richard Dawkins is racist. All right, so so obviously, since she said these things that are unfounded, we have to get rid of this harmful person. But there was no possibility that she could be right. It was like, look how bad she is. She called us racist, right? As if there is no... There is no possibility that, that that could ever be true. There's anything that they need to examine there. But then they they publish this, and so in I, I'm saying this, and when you read it, I mean, like it's 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 so it's in such stunted, morally stunted, bizarre language where you're like, well, wait a minute, we didn't. You skip past the part where you disproved anything she said. But the the, the more important point is. They put this statement on the website, and so it's got a URL, and then they shared it to their important friends, presumably via email. But they did not link that web page to any header on the website. So you cannot – there's no way to get to that web page except through the unique URL. <laughs> so if you, if you get the email, if you get the link in an email saying, you know, this is our statement to our friends and supporters, you click on it, you read this statement – you would have the impression that this is like an, an act of transparency, an yeah. act of yeah. accountability and transparency, right? But they are the only human beings who will ever be able to find that web page. Yeah, well, ever. Because there's no way to get to it. So is that intentional or was that some sort of like boomer mistake or something? Well, it was, I think it's a combination of intention and and general incompetence, but where like, well, it's mostly, it's it's intentional. It serves their purpose they, because there would have been an IT person who had, who helped right. get all this stuff online. And that person would know perfectly well whether this, whether this web page is accessible to the outside world. And so that web page has been archived on Wayback Machine uh, by myself and by another prominent author who writes about uh, skepticism uh, and complementary and alternative medicine in particular. And I encourage you to go read it because first of all, the language is all, I mean, it's just so this could only ever convince people who just have some gap in their understanding of how morality and ethics work, uh, who just don't believe in accountability as a concept. They don't believe they should be held to a standard that others can assess for themselves. Right. Yeah. Send me the link and I'll put it in the show notes. But I mean, the irony of this being the crowd that usually screeches about free speech and tells minorities that they should suck it up when there's like slurs and, you know, all sorts of dehumanizing language. The CEO of the center for inquiry is a woman who has, who is in the past put herself on record as being a free speech absolutist. Right. Which is a silly position in the first place. And then, and then she was the one who decided to remove all of Coven's articles and basically erase her, try to make it look like she was never a part of the organization at all and erase any. Because uh, she dared to criticize the dear leader, you know, yeah. It's so funny. Yeah. It's so funny. Oh, I remember. I think what the precipitating event was that he had gotten up there at the the conference, the the SciCon, the the conference of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, which is another sub organization of the Center for Inquiry. Um, I think that was when he had gotten Ricky Gervais. Ugh. He had egged him on to say that, um, oh, if he had to hear one more word about the cishet patriarchy, he was going to freak out. Or he said something to that effect. But, um, yeah, it was like they were having this conversation about science and being an atheist or whatever. And then Dawkins was like, hmm, what do you think about the regressive left? <laughs> uh, just to get a reaction out of him. And she was very upset about that because she had just got done speaking about bigotry in the movement right uh, right which and, is uh, uh structural inequities very important topic that needs to be addressed and then there's dawkins that just undermines it immediately um yeah and it's just so stupid right like this regressive left bullshit uh was started by majid nawaz 
way back, like I, I forget when, but like 2014, 2015, even in 2016, it was start, the use of the term was starting to be very questionable because of people like Dave Rubin had arrived on the scene and overused it to such an extent where it didn't seem to apply to like someone that was exceptionally bizarre and seemingly regressive on the left, but just seemed to apply to anyone that opposed to any bigotry at all. Anyone that was remotely left was just suddenly regressive left. And so... Right, right, yeah. So for Dawkins to be using that, it's just... And uh, I imagine this was, like, way after 2016, so that's very embarrassing. Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, Dawkins has no idea of the, like, goings-on of the... You know, if somebody has become... Right, 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 I know. I, I can sense that, because sometimes he's on stage with, like, someone like Brett Weinstein, and Brett will mm-hmm. try to do the... Evo psych explanation for uh, why the not for for why the Holocaust happened or some some kind of weird weird ass shit about and suddenly Dawkins like what <laughs> uh, yeah yeah no no let's let's leave that up to the people who actually know about this topic and even he's taken aback by some people in his circle or you know there's a time where he endorsed a heavily Christian evangelical event just because he was so enamored with Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay, also products of the new atheist scene. Um, And they were taking their anti-wokeness to where it was most welcome, like a Christian event with a beginning with a morning prayer. And there was Dawkins saying, yeah, here's, here's a wonderful event. And then people started to make fun of him so much for endorsing this, like, event that began with a morning prayer and uh, then then he deleted it uh so that's funny but uh i want to go back to the church bells tweet for a second because just the idea that someone as grown up as him would be so clueless about something that you know you don't even have to have taken a social science class to understand the dynamics of how something you've grown up with, you might view more fondly or, you know, with this, uh, through the lens of nostalgia or whatever, as opposed to something that is so alien and foreign seeming to you. And I mean, the opposite can happen too. So it's not always the same. Like for example, I grew up in Saudi Arabia. I've lived in Pakistan for a few years and, uh, the call to prayer in Saudi was very, like, they hired some really skilled people. They had the money, and you could just Mm -hmm. tell it was quality, and they were very beautiful and lyrical, and though the state was very forceful about the call to prayer, so in my mind, it was associated with, like, being out at the mall and having to suddenly stop what we're doing because the stores have to shut like in the middle of the day to make sure that everything is closed for prayer time and the morality police would be in the streets and like if they caught you not you know hanging out not going to prayer then they would be like threatening or angry and scary so that's what calls a prayer reminded me of because of those experiences Mm -hmm. even though I recognize that it sounded beautiful and then when I moved Mm -hmm. to Pakistan there's no like it's very chaotic there it's not a very wealthy (laughs) country there's no budgets to hire quality uh, muezzins yeah you can probably hear 10 of them at the same time exactly you can (laughs) exactly so you could hear them Exactly like you said, 10 of them at the same time, all trying to compete with one another, scream over one another, and it sounded like madness. It was not pleasant to the ears at all. Um, But the state was less uh, repressive around the call to prayer. The stores were still open. It was your choice. And so these are different experiences I'm just trying to contextualize, right? So then when I moved to Canada, churches were like 
really a new experience for me just to see them even. I mean, they, they do have churches in Pakistan, but there are very few of them. And Saudi, no, they're not allowed. So I was like, oh, this is so cool. You know, the church bell sounds so sweet until I moved to an apartment that was like right in front of a church. And then, you know, this is like around my college days and we would be hung over and Sunday morning, like the bells would be going and it, it just became so annoying that that like initial novelty aspect of the church bells quickly faded, you know? So these things are so largely dependent on the context that you're listening to them in and they right. change from different like so these days I'm looking at Israel's assault on Gaza and I'm seeing pictures and videos of Muslims praying in the rubble as mm-hmm. an act of defiance and resilience and I'm hearing the death drones that hover above them all the time like it must be such a horrifying sound to have to exist with all day all night you know there's a drone right above you that could like cause you great harm that could kill you at any point and then I'm hearing that uh, they still manage to organize their call to prayer and that it's providing peace to these besieged and starving people and it seems like such a disorienting thing for me because it seems like such a nice and relieving thing for these poor people and that's never Mm -hmm. like been my context for the call to prayer so it's so easy to switch from understanding one situation to another like it's just like it seems to be like it should be a normal human thing to contextualize what you're listening to And it it can't be like a static thing that a call to prayer in Islam is bad and the sound of church bells always is good, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think it just goes to show with guys like Dawkins this deep, deep in curiosity. Yeah. They've sort of marketed themselves as being exactly the opposite. But yeah, yeah, I mean, just in general, there's all these things, there's all these questions he could ask and he doesn't. He's not... He's already said the tweet says, you know, it's it's really it's really implicit in there. Like, I'm done asking. I know what's good. And now it's just my turn to share that all with you. Right. And this isn't even the first time he said something like this. I think it was like in 2014 or maybe 2013. I remember this other tweet going around where Dawkins had quote tweeted like some maybe it was like an Egyptian a guy on TV being interviewed in Arabic and he was like, just the sound of this language. Uh, People tell me it's supposed to sound nice, but all I hear is something guttural and unpleasant. Like these are not the exact words because it's like over a decade ago, but there was definitely a tweet like that. And even I've definitely heard similar sentiments like that from people who, I mean, I think that's, I think that's pretty, it's probably, fairly universal for people who are tend to be reactionaries to like have this disgust at foreign sounds and sights. Right. I mean, if you know anything about Arabic is how many different dialects there are like, and how different they can sound and how some of them are so lyrical. I don't understand Arabic, but I grew up around Arabic. I've heard it all my life, but I don't understand it. And uh, Saudi Arabic sounds very different from Lebanese Arabic and, you know, Egyptian Arabic sounds very different and you can't just like judge the whole language. Yeah. I mean, I think so. Another thing when I look at that tweet that it reminds me of, is so yeah you know as i mentioned i i I advocated for the rights of non-believers um and one way that that happens one like one sort of way that that was borne out in practice was um in the united states opposing school voucher programs and there's this fairly large and effective coalition that has worked to oppose them and so what the, the thing with school vouchers is that basically they they are publicly funded streams of money that are given to pay tuition or fees at private schools, which in itself might not sound so bad, but in the United States, most private schools are religious. So this is effectively funneling public money to the the teaching of religion. So obviously, you know, strident atheists are going to have a huge problem with that. But what is maybe less apparent to people is 
there were a lot of religious based faith based organizations that we worked in coalition with to oppose school vouchers. Huh. You know, there were Baptist organizations, and, and and you know, one of their arguments was if I if I want to donate, like if you're if, for a person who's a Baptist, if I want to donate money to a Baptist school, that's my right and my choice under freedom of religion. Right. But if the government is forcing me to give the money, then they have now taken away my right to choose. Right. How I express my religion and my religious values. And like it was this combination of having all of us in the room together, standing at like a circle around staffers, just like throwing reasons at them why they should oppose this. That was really effective. Right. And I was only able to join in that coalition because my predecessor, who had been that, you know, the advocate for the Center for Inquiry before me, had made a lot of inroads. He had worked to, uh, like, fight the stigma. He had, like, shown and he had proven himself to be a reliable partner and trustworthy and interested in success for all, you know, not just looking out for himself. So, you know, I was, like, really benefiting from this legacy of his. And, you know, when I came to CFI, I harbored a lot of, like, I, I kind of had discovered the movement through Sam Harris, <laughs> For better or worse. So, you know, I started out with some, like, latent, well, yeah, with a substantial amount of, like, you know, latent resentment toward a lot of religious people and religious ideas. And there was this moment when I went to one of these coalition meetings to oppose school vouchers on the grounds that they fund religious instruction. And I was going to go into the meeting, and it was going to be a meeting with people from faith-based organizations, like at least two in there, people who I knew to be religious, and the the CEO of the of the Center for Inquiry, she was having some conversation with somebody that I was like, I wasn't directly a part of it, but I was right standing right next to them, and she made some joke, and it was just a, it was a joke about how religious people are dumb, basically, uh-huh. is what she was saying. And the thing is, like, she had she does this where. Or at least she did at first. She tried to build up camaraderie among the staff through their shared resentments, right? All of right. the people that we have a problem with, like, let's bond over that. Yeah. yeah. And it wasn't like this thing that she said. I don't remember what she said, but the, it like it wasn't funny, right? On any level, like it wasn't a, it wasn't witty. It wasn't a clever play on words. Just hateful. It was just like religious people are dumb, just yeah. snotty. Yeah. And she didn't understand why it didn't land as a joke. But, like, so I had that experience, and then an hour later, I had to go to the, in this room at this meeting, and I was joining forces with these, you know, with people of different religious backgrounds, and I, you know, had to really, like, dig deep into myself and bring all of my respect forward and, you know, really try to, this thing that was, for me, was still pretty new, and I just realized that, like, I could see in myself how hard it was, like, I basically had to pretend that I hadn't heard this joke from my boss an hour ago, right? Like when I was like working together with religious people and, and, yeah. you know, having to show, like having to convey all the respect that my predecessor had proven to them, yeah. you know, that he had and that, and that we were a valued partner for. And I just realized like how much I just, I didn't need that in my life. Like right. if I was going to have to work with these people, and be a respected and valued partner and, and respect them in turn. How much I just didn't need to hear shitty comments like that from my boss. It's so deeply unserious for an organization to be like a Twitter troll, you know? Yeah. Well, and then at the same time, deeply unserious, but then the way they talk about themselves, the self presentation is so <laughs> bombastic <laughs> and so over the top and just loaded with superlatives. And this, you know, I think you see real serious pathological narcissism from the CEO and from Dawkins. And I think that comes through in the way they talk about themselves, where they'll say these things that are so pompous and bombastic. And and there's no apparent, it's not apparent from her remarks or from Dawkins' remarks that there was any moment where they thought people would think that was over the top or that it was ridiculous. Like, they think they're saying something as far as I can tell, they think they're saying something that is, like, really compelling to people. But Richard Dawkins has done more than anybody to, you know, to publicize the science of evolutionary biology. And they talk about him like he's this great man, and it's just... Yeah, and he fails, like, 
on every level in present day. Like, I don't know what he was like when he was younger. Maybe he was with the times and great seeming, but he just seems so unimpressive now. And whether it's on being, you know, for women's rights consistently, because of course they will use this thing about wanting to advocate for women just like they did in the post 9-11 era to justify wars, right? They will use this thing about Muslims mistreat their women and we advocate for women and we're so enlightened. But when it comes to feminists at home, they will take they will take every step to undermine them in every possible well, way. Yeah. There's like the famous elevator gate thing with Rebecca Watson that Dawkins left yeah. a, a famous comment on. Dear Muslima, yes. Yeah. Yes. The Dear Muslima comment. And the, yeah, and what he was doing there is, I mean, he, he makes it very, very obvious that despite everything that he says, that he does not support women's rights in general. Because the only time he will talk about it is if women in quote-unquote Western countries advocate for further advancements for them uh, in their countries, he will then turn around and say, you shouldn't be complaining about your situation because you should be instead devoting those efforts to the much, much more severe situation of women in Islamic countries, right? But this is somebody who, if you ask him, like, okay, so what are you doing for women in Islamic countries or anywhere else? That's not how advocacy works, right? You can't just ask everyone to shut up about their own situation because something is worse somewhere else. No. I once had a conversation with Saudi women about this topic on my podcast, uh, and uh, they were saying about how much they despise being used as a pawn like that, about how much they hate when their Saudi hashtags are like hijacked by the atheist scene and the ex-Muslim scene to undermine feminists in other places just because they don't have it worse than women in Afghanistan or Saudi Arabia or whatever. Yeah, it is a hijacking. And what makes it apparent is that one, to use Dawkins as as an example, he doesn't fight for the rights of women anywhere, Islamic country or anywhere else. He will only ever bring it up when it can be used as a weapon against people advocating for women's rights in in his society, advocating for change in the society he shares. Outside of that context, he is not fighting for the rights of women in Afghanistan or anywhere else. He doesn't, he only uses it to argue against other people getting uppity. Yep. That is um, it, basically and, the standard for the atheist and ex-Muslim scenes, unfortunately. They're also using that to deny that there is a, a, any problem at all. If, if there is any inequality, they're, like, what they're, tr- they're trying to project this picture where if there is any inequality in quote-unquote the West, it would have to be so marginal and so like negligible that it's, that it's functionally non-existent. And they're using that to try to undermine and humiliate and stifle the efforts of people about things they don't know. Again, like he doesn't know if women are equal because he doesn't look into it. He just looks around, assesses his own experience. Well, I don't see women being treated unequally and calls it a day. <laughs> well, crack recently, open the book. didn't he have this like letter exchange with Ian Hersey Ali? Okay. I'm not familiar with this exchange. Was this when she came out as a Christian? I think it might have been after that. Yes. And I didn't focus on that. That exchange too much, but I found this quote. So I don't know if he focused too much on um, making fun of her absolutely ridiculous reasons for coming out as Christian, which was not because of her change of heart or believing. It was to fight wokeness, right? right? Yeah. So he says, I might agree with you. I actually do. That Putinism, Islamism, and postmodernish wokery pokery are three great enemies of decent civilization. I might agree with you that Christianity, if only as a lesser of evils, is a powerful weapon against them. Now, there's his own pro Christianity bias there, so it's not like yeah, using Christianity as a weapon against quote unquote wokeism. That's yeah, that's, and then that's when he's putting it on YouTube 
he puts an image of trans people when he mentions like wokery pokery. So yeah, again, there's somebody helping him do that. There's somebody making that creative. Of course, he's not There's making somebody, it. somebody like, yeah. giving creative input into that. Obviously, that he's not. Yeah. I, I don't imagine him sitting at his computer and editing videos. But I'm sure he's not opposed to the message that, you know, trans equals no, wokeness. Trans people are destroying civilization yeah. at the same level. And he compares it to, like, freaking Islamism and Putinism. So, like, I mean... I, I have no words, right? This is well. They're no. It's not empirical at all. Well, oh, the postmodern whatever he said is like a, a threat to decent civilizations or whatever. There's nothing where he like you know, find, like tried to come up, like come upon a comprehensive list of threats to decent civilizations <laughs> and then quantified them and be like figured out which ones are the most. No, these are just things coming off the top of his head. He couldn't tell you how or why. Which he's getting from Jordan fucking Peterson. Jordan Peterson. Except in the most general and abstract terms, right? Like, well, they're saying this thing that I say undermines science, and isn't that terrible? He couldn't point to you any real harm being done to anybody in the world. And so, you know, he's, he shares all the anti-transgender books by uh, Abigail Schreier yeah. and the other big author. Um, and if you look, I mean, these are just airport books. They're, Was they're Helen? just written by... Helen Joyce? Helen something something. Helen Joyce? Yeah. And he did the same thing with, you know, promoting Douglas Murray's ethnic nationalist. Oh, yeah, the far right. <laughs> That's, like, blatant. Right, but, but again, these are, but these are not books written by experts who are in a peer-reviewed setting where there are serious professional consequences for getting it wrong. Right? They're airport books. They're written f- largely for the entertainment of people who are inclined to agree with them. The evidence is sloppy, and that's been and that's been you know demonstrated by people who have taken much closer looks at it than me. If there's any evidence provided at all in Douglas Murray's book, like I've read several chapters of it, uh, unfortunately, the War on the West, it is beyond sloppy. It is. Right, a, it's embarrassing. It's it's a yeah, clown it's show. It's, Just white nationalist talking points written with the help of a thesaurus to make it sound a little bit better. And people like yeah. Dawkins, who are supposed to be skeptics, are buying this and promoting it on their right. And he doesn't platforms. he doesn't understand, nor nor has he ever tried to figure out if there is a such thing as a white nationalist talking point that would sort of be something that could be packaged and then repackaged by people who are trying to make themselves look benign or benevolent, like Douglas Murray. Oh, gosh, so I'm just a posh. Right. Smart Brit wants what's best for everybody. Um, there is no, there is no understanding that that is a thing that can be that can be out there that you then can watch out for, and that someone who has real humanist values can be per- perpetually on the lookout for, so they are not used as a useful idiot right. for fascists or reactionaries. Right, but like uh, he doesn't feel like that sort of extremism is a threat to him personally, I guess. So no, no. And since he's not a humanist and he doesn't share humanist values, he's not moved for the plight of people who have nothing in common with him. Uh, and who share none of his privileges. People that are that short-sighted, uh, I find very silly because I'd say that white nationalism threatens everyone, including sure. straight white men, uh, because eventually it will come for you and something or someone that you love because it is a destructive fascist ideology and it will come for atheists for fuck's sake. Like, Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I, 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 I try to be careful not to get into the, like, you know, argument that, like, you should do it because it's in your own self-interest. Of course, for yes, privileged groups. if you I need definitely, it. Myself, I definitely, like, you know, and in the United States, we're, we're facing a very real authoritarian takeover here. Yeah. Which is, incidentally, something I, I warned the CEO of Center for Inquiry about when I was doing policy work, and she totally dismissed and denied that it was even true. Yeah. But I definitely, like, I would get put in the leftist intellectual box, I'm pretty sure, pretty quickly, if the fascists take over. So I don't feel very safe right. as a white man. But, and also, I mean, the other way that it hurts your self-interest is it makes society more boring. It just makes it grayer and less interesting, and there's less stuff to do. That's something I think all these, you know, people who go to these conferences of the legacy organizations that have been listening to the same speakers for 80 years, 
they don't realize how boring they are and how just like when there are a bunch of people of different races and ages in the room, the entire room is just more fun to be in. That, that's, that's just lost on that. And that's why I really think that there is a new generation that hopefully, you know, will need the legacy organization less and will just, as atheism and as non-belief become more mainstream and more popular, guys like Dawkins, single figureheads, will have less of the say. They will be a smaller portion of what goes on. Let's hope. Cheers to that. Yeah. Cheers. Um, but you know, what worries me is that the reason that these organizations gain popularity, gain support is because in some way they are justifying or upholding the status quo, justifying and rationalizing very old types of bigotries. And that is what gets the support from powerful people. So, yeah, I mean, I think you're you're touching on something that's actually a, a larger issue with the nonprofit sector in general. Right. And it ties into the sort of, you know, politics and economics that guys like Dawkins want to pretend don't exist. But as the United States becomes, as wealth becomes more concentrated in a tiny, tiny, yeah. tinier and tighter proportion of the population, those are the only people who can really afford to donate to yeah. nonprofit organizations. So ever more and more and more, like every year, most nonprofits are more and more beholden to a smaller number yes. of richer, whiter, older yes. men who are inherently conservative who inherently just reject change. Yes, and this is why people should people with a any bit of a skeptical mind should be terrified of these movements like effective altruism, which sound very nice in theory. Uh, make altruism more effective and efficient? Why the fuck not? But no, that is not what it's about. <laughs> it is about so much more than that. Torres, there's this guy on yes. social media. I think it's Dr. Emil. Emil Torres, but yeah, he's done a lot of deep dives on yeah. the very, very, very scary the places that that movement's gone intellectually that I'm no expert on. So I believe um, they use the they, them pronouns, but yeah. Oh, oh, they did. Oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that. Okay. I'm sorry about that. I apologize to them. I, I think, uh, they have done some good work. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any other interesting stories that you've got, like, that other people would not know about Dawkins, like, from behind the scenes? Not about Dawkins himself, I think, just because, you know, our, it, we were just, again, totally isolated. This He was supposed to be the figurehead of this organization, and we were basically kept at a distance from him. This sounds so culty. Well, it is, and it's, but it's, it is. It's very culty, and it just goes to show... I mean, he had sort of found this, he, they, he's built the structure, this leadership structure, or he's installed this leadership structure, he doesn't build anything, uh, at this organization that of people who think very, very similarly to him. So there's... So like an echo chamber. It's very difficult for new information. Like, if you say something, if you, like, I mean, I had so many conversations with the CEO, where she would say something that was objectively false. <laughs> And I would be like, I'm sorry, that's that's not that's incorrect. And she would frame that as an act of insubordination. <laughs> you know, say, if I can't have a conversation with you, boss, to subordinate, then this isn't going to work. Okay, tell tell me how that's not like a religious. And I'm just sitting there like, but you, but you just went on. She will say it to people's faces. We have truth and reason on our side. Oh God. This is. I mean, the most bombastic, <laughs> ridiculous, over the top things. And then when you're like, "Well, I'm sorry, that's objectively false." And if you if you allow me to pull my cell phone out of my pocket, I can Google the article that disproves it. And she will say, "No, she will not look at that article that disproves it." Okay, this sounds you like a religious madrasa, where you yeah. <laughs> where you're just told that you have the truth on your side. I'm not. I'm not surprised to hear you make that comparison. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing where it's it's so completely bass backwards from from everything that they claim to be. And they, they you know, it, humanism that's a lot to aspire to. If you're going to put your name on that and say these are our values, there's are those are tough values to live up to. And it, you're really going to have to show people that you are going out of your way to live up to them, you know? Pe you, it's going to be very easy for people to find cracks and places where you fell short. 
And you're going to be, need to be ready to address that and speak honestly and openly about it. And they can't. They, they literally, as people, the organization is led by people who constitutionally cannot and will not do that. And it's so embarrassing. I was, I was fired from CFI for, quote, unquote, insubordination and other performance-related conduct. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that. Yeah. And you so, were let go. Yes, I was. And... You know, back in my community college days, I had worked as a as a bartender to to make ends meet. So, you know, when I got fired, I, I just I just hopped down the street and started tending bars short term, just to you know right. just to make rent in the meantime. And I just found myself like I've always in my I've always been drawn to the nonprofit sector because I I, I it's really hard for me to do a job. It's really hard for me to spend forty hours doing something that I don't really believe in, right? And that I think is really good. A change. Yeah, I feel the same. And so I would be, I was tending bar and, and finding myself like happiest I've been in a long time and, and trying to figure out why, because like, I'm not inherently psyched that the owner of the restaurant gets to get rich while, you know, I, <laughs> and I walk home with my minimum wage, but I just realized I'm not having to lie to people here. I'm not, this restaurant doesn't claim to be anything that it's not. <laughs> I make drinks. You, you drink them. We make we make food. You eat. So it. wait, wait. It's you not know, saying that it has truth and reason on its side, and then right. Yeah, yeah. No, you. there's no there's no banner. Yeah. <laughs> um, that is some Orwellian shit. Oh yeah, and also, uh, so here's actually there's I've I've given a Twitter thread about this too, but um, one of the things that you see in the between the the pre and post. So I don't know how much you or listeners know, but the Center for Inquiry, as I said, is a it's a large, it's a fairly large nonprofit in the United States, and it now has like incorporated numerous other smaller organizations that had one at one point been independent. Um, the Richard Dawkins Foundation was independent until I think 2016 or so. The Richard Dawkins Foundation was its own 501c3 nonprofit, but it then merged with Center for Inquiry at a certain point. And when it did, you can really see the values of the like asshole atheist right take over. And one of the most hilarious parts of that is the Center for Inquiry, which had heretofore been very sort of humanist oriented, had science, reason, and humanist values as its tagline. Right? And so there's places on the website where you can where you can go on their website and you can see that, see that that phrase, science, reason, humanist values. Um, and it's been there for a long, long time, right? But there are other parts where when the new CEO came in, who was Dawkins' functionary, she told them to stop using humanist values and to start saying secular values. Oh, I wonder. Because what do humanist values even mean, right? And, and the point is, like, I mean, this is a, it's, it's an appeal to morality that she doesn't share and she doesn't identify with. And secular values can just mean religion back. Right, 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 right. You know, Right. And do you think do you think that had anything to do with the humanist association revoking his award until she didn't want to be Well that was this was this happened before, oh, before. way before oh, okay. way before but the the punchline here is there are web pages on the site where you can see both phrases side by side you can see the old science reason humanist values and science reason secular values that has just inexplicably now been changed to this phrase that means almost nothing secular values and you can see where they, they just, she didn't, nobody went to the trouble to, like, make the whole website coherent. It's just, like, you know, totally not transparent, just changing uh, an important word, that, like, appealing to the set of values that people are donating money to, that this organization has a mission of advancing. Just totally just changing it unilaterally on a whim uh, with no input from anybody and doing so half acidly having different parts of the website where it says different things and also just eroding any sort of moral high ground or moral standard that they would then have to aspire to and live up to. Right. All while people who, you know, have been there in a humanist capacity, like working either on projects that are explicitly humanist or are there, you know, will tell you they're there because they are humanist have been there for years before this merger ever occurred that now have to sit there and watch this happen. And now have to choose, you know, do I continue to take this paycheck to do this work that is increasingly inane at best yeah. and harmful and obnoxious and toxic at worst? Or do I leave? Or do I leave this thing that, like, I've really devoted my life to and, 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 and it's been an important part of me 
do I walk away from it? And if I did, where would I go? And there's a lot of people that I saw who were in that situation, in that organization. And it's really sad to me. Right. And even outside of the organization level, if you just look at the atheist scene in general for years, for years, so many people refuse to speak out about it. Because if you do, if you speak out about the systemic widespread issues of sexism, uh, sexual predators, racism, transphobia, bigotry of all sorts then you're cast out. Like you're just like someone that nobody wants to support or associate with inside that little insular, increasingly right-wing atheist uh, bubble. And uh, that's why most people who want to maintain like atheists as part of their brand, they just don't want to talk about it. And in fact, even if they swing left a little, they will um, attack people who will speak out about it. So I don't know if you remember a couple years ago, there was this whole merge gate situation where the same person you were talking about, um, Emil Torres, who's written about extensively about effective altruism and it's associated mm-hmm. little... They wrote an article about how new atheism has merged or is merging, I forget, merged with the far right. And there was such a backlash, not just, I mean, no one is surprised that there was a backlash from like the right wing atheists. Nobody cares about that. What was surprising is like the more self-proclaimed feminist left bro atheist podcaster crew went nuts at this time. And it was shocking because you thought that they were on the right side generally, but they just weren't willing to take this criticism of the movement as a whole. They would prefer to keep it as, uh, there's a few bad apples, but let's well, not. Well, yeah, I think, I think I remember there was also a lot of, there's a lot of pedantry. Yes. Uh, and a lot of, <laughs> so uh, much, um, so much. Semantics around the word, around what it means to merge. Yes. But, <laughs> it was beyond but ridiculous. I, I, if I remember correctly, I think that's a controversy. Back then, Tim Pool was still passing himself off as a, like, no. you know, quote unquote, left leaning no, no, guy no, no, or whatever. No, 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 that was only in 2021. Tim Pool, I think, stopped passing himself off as that in, like, what, 20. 20- 17 or something so okay then okay so then there may be two different articles because i'm okay uh i maybe this may have been published in the rolling stone oh no the one uh, i'm talking about was, is a salon article okay so the one that i'm thinking of was was research that had been done to show that Basically, the, the new atheist figures were kind of a pipeline. They were an internet pipeline to the far right, to radicalization. And they and it, and it looked at how YouTube's algorithm fostered yeah. that, how the algorithm was was like basically designed to radicalize. And what they and what they did was they, they did it. They showed how you know like when you if you look at it if you if you find some video to watch on YouTube, there is a now the algorithm is then tracking all of your activity and recommends another video that it thinks you'll want to keep your eyeballs on yeah. based on the ones that you have been watching so far. Right. And so if you just keep going, if you just keep accepting its recommendations and watching, 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 um, if you start from, you know, Sam Harris or any of the big new atheists, like the algorithm will eventually conclude that the thing that you will really want to watch is far right propaganda. And I remember at the time that this research was published, they tried to discredit it. I'm pretty sure Tim Pool was one of the people. The point I was was going to make was that so when people who you know felt implicated or who hated this news tried to push back against it, they tried to say like, "Oh no, the algorithm pushes people toward left leaning sites as much as it does right wing ones." But then when you went to the article and you looked at the finer print. You found that these there, there were there were occasions where the the, rec- the algorithm would recommend a like quote unquote left wing atheist video, but it would only it it was doing that when the headline of the video was written sarcastically. Right. So like it would be a left wing person like sarcastically saying like oh you know we go these immigrants are a problem or, or just something like that that would so the algorithm read that headline took it at face value and thought it was right. a right-wing site that it was pushing to them. Those were the only times that it made that recommendation. And and it was just like, it was, if you read the article, it was such an easy thing to notice. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's indisputable at this point. I've done so many episodes on it and listed off oh, so much, so many connections and so much evidence about how they intersect with the far right, how they merge with the far right, and how they're a stepping stone uh, to the far right. Like, constantly, they repackage the same talking points and... I don't know if you remember back in the day, like around the time of the Syrian migrant crisis, there was a guy popular on atheist Twitter called Jihadist Joe, and Dawkins particularly loved him. So he was supposed to be a satirical account, where he was supposed to be a jihadist and just like tweeting as a jihadist. And it's like, there was no uh, satirical element to that, the way that account tweeted. Basically, he just tweeted his own bigoted views about, like, what he thinks of Muslims. <laughs> and so, yeah. you know, he would, like, tweet about how he likes to fuck goats and shit, or how Western civilization was superior, and often very dog whistly or sometimes even openly white nationalist points. And there was a point where they had an event scheduled with an open white nationalist and he refused to acknowledge that it was a problem to be chatting alongside a white nationalist and saying the same things as him, demonizing immigrants, etc., etc. And Dawkins would boost that account frequently and... Um, never ever uh, responded to any of the people pointing out to him that this was a racist account. In fact, they also... No, he never does. No. They started a publication called Vive Charlie off the backs of the Charlie Hebdo massacre, and they had, like, explicitly racist caricatures of, like, Obama and of migrants being depicted as insects and, uh, like, just, like, very Nazi-esque shit. And uh, Dawkins would retweet that publication, too. Yeah, yeah, and, and there's no, there, he has no personal responsibility or accountability. Any negative consequences that come to anything that he does that are unintended, well, you just shouldn't that just should never be held against him. You should just forget about that. And you should just remember all the great books that he wrote 30 years ago. Right. And yeah, there's another tweet that I think is, is revealing reveals uh, about his worldview more than I think maybe people appreciate at the time. Um, but in November 25th, 2021, he reposted an article about, um, you know, the headline is, is the mob coming for Charles Darwin? And he basically, at this point, he had, he had complained about a few like, I think largely 19th century British scientists who had become, you know, famous for their for their discoveries, um, who had then later been criticized or they had had their name taken off of a building at Oxford or something right. because people were like, oh, well, when we when we actually look at this, like he was a huge racist and misogynist, <laughs> and and we don't want that associated with our university, so we're going to take the guy's name off and we're going to put a new name on the side of this wall. You know, right. and Dawkins would treat that as a true, genuine tragedy yeah. of real material consequence that a guy's name was taken off the wall and we're going to put up somebody else's name instead. And what he said in this tweet was giants of the past, sanctimoniously judged by non-entities of the present whose only qualification is still being alive to do so. It's just so stupid. Well, it is. I, what I want to hone in on there is the word non-entities, right? Because... You know, when Dawkins got his Humanist of the Year award stripped from him, there was a lot of people saying, like, basically, like, yeah, right. This guy's done so much more for humanism and for science than you or I ever will. As if, like, what he does in the present and his behavior and how he affects other people, that, 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 that ceases to matter. <laughs> but the fact that he said non-entities, right, he, he, he's talking about Charles Darwin as this giant, this scientific giant. But he's saying that. These people who are who are quote unquote judging him and taking his name off of the wall of a building, they don't matter. They have no qualification to assess his behavior. And that's because the guy made scientific discoveries. And that is more important than anything else that he says or does. And that I think is important. So we can never re examine. We can never re examine, never update, never 
anything, just statically cling on to these historical figures without... Well, what's important here, or at least what I'm trying to highlight is how anti-humanist this is. Right. Right. The term non-entities. Maybe a guy like Richard Dawkins, maybe he can judge Charles Darwin. (laughs) He's a fellow giant of his, right? So maybe he could issue some, he won't, but he could issue some judgment of this guy's behavior. But you and me, no, we don't matter. We don't have anything about us. There's nothing about us as humans that means that we should get to say, oh, I don't like that this guy's a sex pest or I don't like that this guy's a racist. It simply doesn't matter because so, they did something. So if like a woke Hollywood star said it, would Dawkins accept that? No, no. I wouldn't. doubt it. No, no. I mean, I think I think he fundamentally disagrees with the judgment. Like, no, no, this guy's exactly this, this name. These letters and that comprise this name need to stay bolted to the side of this wall forever now because he discovered electricity. But in any event, if there were anybody who, who would have the, uh, you know, the, the moral legitimacy to remove those letters from the wall, it would not be you or I. It would be somebody like Dawkins himself. And that's where I just want to. I mean, it was, it was a shitty tweet, I and mean, he was just he was he was being his usual jerk self. But I think it gets lost some of the things that he says that reveal just how much contempt he has for most people, and just how much he does not see himself as being in a shared effort with all of us right. to make a better yeah. world. Yeah, just a selfish douchebag on every level. But it's also very like anti atheist to have this value that we should never update our views, we should never update our beliefs, we should cling to historical figures without any reflection. I think what he would do if he heard you say that is he would try to misdirect the conversation back to, well, you're not going to, you haven't updated his discovery of electricity. It's it's scientific accomplishments stand on their own. Sure, so put them in a history book. And he's not getting the part where what we're updating is, okay, now, now in 2024, you need to discover electricity and you need to not be a <laughs> but racist, that's, or we don't want anything no, no, to do with you. No, no, that is not a valid response, because if I'm responding to that, I'm saying I'm not saying erase his discovery from our memory, put it in a history book. I'm saying right. he does not, whoever the scientist in question that we're talking about today, does not need to be honored on a side of a building. Right, there is no... And th- right, there is no particular reason, there is no scientific value in lionizing this one person who made this one discovery or set of discoveries. We are still going to keep all their facts in the in the textbooks. Like those don't yeah. they don't own Charles Darwin, Huxley. These people don't own these facts that they discovered. We now can have them, and we can disavow everything else that guy ever said or did or believed. Imagine if everyone thought like that. If if everyone took Dawkins seriously like that, then the church would have never moved on from punishing people for heresy. No, yeah. I mean, Do you see what I'm saying? Oh, absolutely. I because mean, if. If we're like, don't question this person has great achievements, don't question this ideology, don't question this, then you can never question or update from the view that uh, the earth is flat, even. Yeah. This is how we move forward. This is how science progresses, too. We should be demanding better uh, as our values update and uh, as we accumulate more knowledge. It's ridiculous to be static in that, especially as a scientist, especially as an atheist. It's so beyond ridiculous. And speaking of science and stuff, I mean, his tweets about trans people are his particular target these days. It's so awful how transphobic he is. It's definitely, yeah, it's definitely masked off at this point. There's a, like... I think there's a decision of his that, like, there's no going back now, and, like, this is going to be the legacy that he's going to die with. And, look, I understand that he's in his 80s. I understand that he's an old man. But, like, then shut up and take a seat, man. Like, you just are not (laughs) up to date. You know, if my grandparent or if my dad were to have a massive platform, I'm sure he would have views that are not the best on certain things, and I would hate that. So I would take away his Twitter app. I would not re-download it for him if it was my dad. Do you know um, what I'm saying? Like, I have a soft spot for the fact that he is an older man, and perhaps he's not 
at his sharpest right now. And uh, maybe my elderly relatives would be saying things that I would be embarrassed by. But then I would try to intervene and not let them make a mockery of their legacy in front of their millions of people wide platform, you know? And I am old enough to remember when they used to talk about how, you know, Islam is incompatible with the West and they're so homophobic and they don't tolerate people different from them, blah, blah, blah. And that's why we can't let more immigrants in and things like, I mean, it was less Dawkins that talked about the immigrants and more Murray and Sam Harris, but Dawkins, you know, has nodded along and retweeted these types of things plenty of times. So, and now he's right. the one that is being intolerant of people that don't fall into his narrow binary view of gender or sexuality or whatever. So when it's the Muslims doing it, oh, let's get behind that and say that is uncivilized and not something we tolerate in the West. But if it's the Christians or if it's uh, the, the Dawkins types, then, well, you know, that's just rational and logical. Yeah, well, I think what they're going to... he's Yeah, like with, with something like, you know with transgender people and sex as a binary, him and his defenders are just always going to come back to, well, no, he's just telling you the science. He's not, he's not issuing a normative judgment. I mean, that's not true. <laughs> no, it's, yeah, it's not true. It's not true. He's, first of all, he's, he's not telling you the science or he's just completely misleading you or misinterpreting the importance of the science because people will point out the existence of intersex people means that your narrative well did you see his did you see his recent tweet on that i mean it was so embarrassing yes i did yes As i did a scientist so but this is all what's more embarrassing about it is it's something that's been it, it, it's been explained to him a thousand times why it's wrong and he just ignores that and he keeps saying it. So on 18th March, he tweeted, Those who say sex is a spectrum don't realize how rare intersex humans are. Frequency histogram runs out of graph paper. So represent frequency of unambiguous males and females by New York's Twin Towers, respectively. Then frequency of intersexes is a medium-sized molehill. Sex is binary. I mean, it's so... It's such a weird tweet, too. Aside from being so wrong, uh, it's so weird. Yeah. What's doing there? He's saying, oh, those who say sex is a spectrum don't realize that. That, for, that right there, just first order, first assertion that he said is wrong and ignorant. They do realize it, and they point it out all the time. You know, there are advocacy organizations for the intersex community. They're very open and transparent about all of this on their website. He is not revealing the news to anybody who has ever, who has been looking into this. And how scientific is it to say if something is rare, you just don't count it? Like... For me, the underlying issue there is the fact that he's presenting this as important goes to show, like, whether somebody, you know, uses the term man or woman to describe themselves or whether society at large describes themselves about that, he doesn't need to care. It doesn't matter what it says in a biology textbook. What matters is how we treat people in the here and now. It matters whether people are driven to depression and suicide because they are constantly just relentlessly pounded with these, with these you know, gender binary messages. And it's so very, very obvious that humans can and do behave in any in any diverse number of ways. There is no reason why you should especially care for social or political purposes that sex is a binary. But just as a visualization, people were tweeting at him like this uh, pie chart that, you know, people were joking that atoms are binary because yeah, the Katie right, Montgomery. Multiple people tweeted at him. T types of atom in the universe: yeah. helium, twenty-five percent; hydrogen, seventy-four percent; and other one percent. So, <laughs> right, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. And it's about the way that he's talking about it and the way that he's framing the issue. And so he had said in this in this interview a couple of years ago. I think this might have been after he lost the after AHA stripped his Humanist of the Year award. He was in an, an a UK magazine, and he was quoted as saying something about how 
you know, I, I basically he was saying like, you know, I, I'll humor the transgender people in my life. Yeah. I, I'll, you know, I'll, for the sake of being polite, I'll use their preferred pronouns. But Dawkins is such a it, it's just it's just there are so few people with fewer excuses than him. Like he put in, he, especially this guy who packages himself as one of the most brilliant people. <laughs> um, well, that's... He probably I'm sure as a professor emeritus at oxford he has lifetime access to every database in the entire university system he's got the world's knowledge at his fingertips yeah, but you're assuming he actually wants he to bother. learn he doesn't he just wants to well no he can't yeah, he clearly doesn't he clearly doesn't the funny thing is i was looking through his twitter timeline and one of his most recent tweets is i think it's from today actually yeah today oh look at that we are talking about dawkins and it's his birthday today did you know that I did not know that. Yeah. So he tweeted. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, just fancy that. To commemorate my birthday, 26th March, which is also the day we are recording, and the coining of the word meme in 1976, someone has created a meme coin. The Daw Coin. <laughs> I don't even know what that means, but it sounds intriguing, he says. <laughs> I don't know. Like... I don't know, is this some kind of crypto shit? Like, what is a meme coin? I don't know what a meme coin is. That's what it sounds like. I don't know. But of course, there's no link to it, no. so none of us can have any idea what he's talking about. Daw coin. <laughs> the daw coin. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Isn't it funny, though, that we are talking on the occasion of his birthday? Yeah, I mean that's definitely a coincidence that I <laughs> I hadn't I hadn't anticipated. <laughs> right, me neither. But hey, look, we celebrated Dawkins plenty today. Yes, we did. We definitely, yeah, in a manner of speaking, <laughs> we sure. honored him the way he deserves to be honored. Yeah, we absolutely we gave him all the honor and respect that is due a man of his stature. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, with that, do you have any parting words? Any uh, quick secret Dawkins stories? Or the only other thing I would say is I just wanted to give a note that you know you mentioned that a lot of the larger atheists and secular organizations are cesspools of reactionary bigotry and just general ignorance. But I wanted to give another shout out. I, I mentioned American Atheists, which is a national organization. I also wanted to mention Atheists United, which is a group that's headquartered in Los Angeles. Okay. They're a local group there. They have a young, forward-thinking executive director, and they do a lot of real, legit outreach and work in the, the Los Angeles area. They do real, like, charitable work where they all show up as volunteers and they do they do real stuff to help people regardless of their religious yeah, yeah. background and they are i think another example of, of a very bright spot and an organization that has the potential to do a lot of good and i think that you know as much as we i think that as part of of, of criticizing and holding to account uh, organizations for toxic behavior and for uh, backward thinking. I think it's really important to give people the example absolutely. of these organizations that do do good work. Absolutely. And that are absolutely willing to work with people who are different from them. And they, it's not nothing that they're doing is rooted in contempt. They don't they don't organize around who they have a problem with. You know, they organize around making a better world for everyone. That's great to hear. I've not heard of them before, but Atheists United, you say? Yes. Well, look, if anyone from Atheists United is listening, hey, reach out. Maybe we can uh, chat about what you guys are doing. And, yeah, I'm always open to hearing from like-minded fellow atheists. I still believe strongly that atheist advocacy is a great thing. And uh, as disappointing as many of the organizations have been, I think there's a chance there might be change. So, yeah, reach out if you are not like those atheists. Well, thanks so much for, for having me on. This was great. Yeah, it was a pleasure chatting with you. I know we had been trying to make it happen. I'm glad we could on the occasion of Dawkins' birthday. That 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 is so funny to me. But um, thanks again for coming on. You're welcome. Have a great day. You too. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support it, there are several ways you can do that. You can share it online 
talk about what you just heard. You can leave a five-star review to help others find it too. And you can also subscribe via patreon.com forward slash nice mangoes. No E in mangoes. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter before it's uh, completely wrecked, you'll find me at nice mangoes. Again, no E in mangoes.